In the previous videos, we saw how the development of quantum mechanics began. At the very start, Sadi Carnot's study of the steam engine inspired the field of thermodynamics. Rudolf Clausius introduced the concept of entropy to quantitatively describe the reversibility of processes, and the law of energy conservation was introduced to understand the conversion of heat energy to mechanical energy. Ludwig Boltzmann explained these phenomena at the microscopic level with statistical mechanics. Understanding the relation between temperature and heat led to the concept of blackbody radiation. An object at a certain fixed temperature, which is able to emit and absorb all frequencies of radiation, will emit radiation with a certain spectrum, whose shape depends on the object's temperature. The precise formula for this radiation spectrum and the understanding and derivation of it was considered a very important fundamental question of thermodynamics. At first, Wilhelm Wien constructed a formula that fits the experimental data, and it could be somewhat justified by fundamental physical principles, even though this justification was rather shaky. Max Planck tried to rederive the same formula, but this time using entropy as the fundamental starting point. He indeed came up with another derivation for Wien's formula, but soon after, new experimental data showed that Wien's original formula for the blackbody radiation spectrum was not valid for longer infrared wavelengths. Because of this, Planck had to tweak his derivation to find a new formula that did match the new experimental observations. However, this tweaking was initially considered merely a mathematical trick, without much physical justification. Planck had to turn to Boltzmann's statistical mechanics, which he previously had disliked, to find a physical justification for his new blackbody radiation spectrum formula. In the new derivation for his formula, it was assumed that the oscillators, which are emitting radiation, can only oscillate at certain discrete energy levels. Planck thought of it as merely a mathematical model, rather than some physical reality. Albert Einstein, however, did take the notion of quantized energy seriously. Inspired by arguments from entropy and experimental observations such as the photoelectric effect, fluorescence and photoionization, he proposed that light was composed of discrete packets of energy. Because of the stark contradiction with the well-established wave theory of light, which saw its ultimate success in the discovery of Maxwell's equations, Einstein's idea of quantized light was met with significant skepticism. However, his idea of quantized energy levels of molecular vibrations, to explain the heat capacity of solids at low temperature, was more readily accepted. The serious development of quantum mechanics had started. Another phenomenon that drove the development of quantum mechanics were the spectral lines of chemical elements. Each element can emit light only at a very specific set of frequencies, and this could not be explained with classical physics. Niels Bohr explained this phenomenon by assuming that the electrons in an atom can orbit the nucleus only in a discrete set of energy levels. The frequencies of the spectral lines are determined by the difference between the energy levels. This model explained the spectral lines of hydrogen, the simplest element, very convincingly. However, Bohr's atomic model was in stark contradiction with classical theory. According to classical theory, an electron should be able to orbit the nucleus with any energy, and it should emit radiation with a frequency that is determined by its orbital frequency, not by the difference between energy levels. So Einstein's model of quantized light, and Bohr's model of quantized atomic energy levels, both had significant departures from the classical theory of physics. But the experimental evidence for the new models were mounting. Examples include the Frank Hertz experiment, and Compton scattering. We have therefore arrived at a point where quantum theory should be taken seriously, even though it is still extremely incoherent. It consists of a bunch of apparently arbitrary quantization conditions, which are invoked on an ad hoc basis to explain certain experimental observations. What we want instead is a single consistent framework of rules within which we can explain all observations without invoking ad hoc rules and exceptions. This framework came with the matrix mechanics of Werner Heisenberg. The development of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics can be summarized as follows.
First, the phenomenon of dispersion had to be understood in terms of the new quantum physics. Dispersion describes how the refractive index of a material depends on the wavelength of the incident light. Hendrik Lorentz successfully described this phenomenon classically, by assuming that incident radiation makes the electron oscillate, and that the oscillating electron re-emits radiation. An important prediction of classical theory is that the frequency of the emitted radiation equals the frequency at which the electron oscillates. According to the quantum model, however, the emitted radiation is not caused by an oscillating electron, but by the transition between electron energy levels. In this model, which is necessary to explain the observed atomic spectral lines, the radiation frequency does not equal the electron's oscillation frequency. Therefore, the main challenge was to explain why the resonance frequencies observed in dispersion coincided with the frequencies of the atom spectral lines. That is, the observed resonance frequencies correspond to the transitions between electron energy levels rather than the orbital frequencies of the electrons as the dispersion model of Lorentz requires. Hendrik Kramers and Werner Heisenberg constructed a formula that describes dispersion in terms of quantum transitions. This mathematical description drew the following peculiar picture. It seemed as if each transition between electron energy levels can be thought of as an oscillating charge that emits radiation whose frequency equals the charge's oscillation frequency. Some of these oscillating charges would need to have a negative mass if we want to reproduce the classical formula for dispersion. Therefore, these oscillating charges were termed virtual oscillators. There's probably nothing that is physically oscillating, but if we pretend that there is, we can explain the dispersion that we observe. So the reasoning of Heisenberg was the following. A quantum theory should successfully describe the atomic spectral lines that we observe. The spectral lines cannot be explained by assuming that orbiting electrons emit radiation, as classical physics says. Rather, the spectral lines are explained by assuming that there is a collection of virtual oscillators that somehow correspond to transitions between energy levels. Therefore, let's try to describe the electron as a collection of virtual oscillators, rather than a point particle with a definite orbit. After all, we can never observe electron orbits directly anyway, because to see an orbiting electron means shining light on it with an extremely high frequency, because a high-resolution image can only be formed with high-frequency light. But high-frequency light consists of highly energetic photons, and shining a highly energetic photon on an electron causes a transition which changes the electron orbit. Therefore, we can never directly observe an electron orbit, so we shouldn't a priori assume that it exists. Rather, what we can directly observe are the atomic spectral lines, which are caused by virtual oscillators. Therefore, in quantum mechanics we should abandon the idea of a well-defined electron orbit, but rather describe a single electron as a collection of virtual oscillators, which correspond to a collection of electron transitions, as defined in the Bohr model. But then the question is, what laws should such a collection of virtual oscillators obey? Classically, an electron is a particle that follows Newton's laws of motion. And from those laws, it follows that an electron can orbit an atomic nucleus, in the same way that a planet orbits the Sun. But what could the laws of motion be if we abandon the idea of a well-defined orbit? To find the answer to this question, Heisenberg relied on Bohr's correspondence principle. This principle states that in the limit of high-energy electron states, the quantum mechanical laws should reduce to the classical laws. In particular, radiation frequencies should coincide with the electron oscillation frequencies. This means that different electron transitions should correspond to different harmonics of the electron oscillation. By considering how one should perform calculations with these harmonics, it was found that the collection of virtual oscillators should obey the same calculation rules as matrices do. Therefore, the set of virtual oscillators is a matrix. Heisenberg assumed that the classical laws of motions are still valid, except now the position of an electron is not a scalar, but a matrix, which should be multiplied according to the law of matrix multiplication.
but then other difficulties arise. The product of two matrices does not commute. So, if in classical mechanics we take the product of two quantities, how should we take the product in quantum mechanics? Also, what does it mean to take the derivative of a matrix with respect to another matrix? It turns out that to find the commutator of two matrices, we can use Sommerfeld's quantization condition from the old quantum theory. From this it follows that the commutator of the position matrix and the momentum matrix is the imaginary unit i times the reduced Planck's constant h bar. Moreover, the derivative of a matrix with respect to another matrix is described by a commutator, because a commutator satisfies the product rule, just like differentiation does. In particular, by considering the classical Hamiltonian equations of motion, we find that the derivative with respect to the position matrix corresponds to a commutator with a momentum matrix. These are the fundamental principles of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics for quantum physics. Position and momentum are described by matrices. These matrices satisfy a certain commutation relation, and the equations of motion involve commutators. To confirm the validity of this new matrix mechanics, it was verified that these rules are in agreement with all the results that were previously described by the ad hoc quantization rules of the old quantum mechanics. In particular, Wolfgang Pauli demonstrated that matrix mechanics correctly describes the known properties of the hydrogen spectrum. Now let's look at each step of this development in more detail. First, let's understand in more detail the connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. Understanding this connection is crucial when guessing new quantum mechanical laws, since the well-established theory of classical mechanics should be the starting point for developing new theories of physics. The first question one can ask is, how do we know which classical quantities should be quantized and which should not? In the old quantum theory, the adiabatic hypothesis served as a guideline to determine which quantities should be quantized. It basically says that if in classical mechanics a quantity cannot change gradually, then in quantum mechanics that quantity also cannot change gradually, but rather it can only change in discrete jumps. This hypothesis was mainly developed by Paul Ehrenfest, but it was initially met with resistance from Arnold Sommerfeld. When Sommerfeld eventually did acknowledge the value of this hypothesis, he did not attribute its first formulation to Ehrenfest, but rather to a discussion between Lorentz and Einstein during the Solvay Congress, which upset Ehrenfest very much. In Sommerfeld's influential book Atomic Structure and Spectral Lines, the section about the adiabatic hypothesis indeed starts with the discussion between Lorentz and Einstein. This discussion was about the harmonic oscillator, which Einstein proposed has quantized energy values. Lorentz imagined the quantum harmonic oscillator as a swinging pendulum with quantized energy levels. We start with a quantum state where the energy equals Planck's constant h times the oscillation frequency f. Then we can change the length of the rope to change the energy and frequency of the pendulum such that the energy is no longer h times f. It appears that we can force the pendulum into a state that should not be allowed by the quantum rules. Einstein responded by saying that if we change the length of the rope not suddenly but gradually, or adiabatically, then the energy and frequency do change in such a way that the energy remains equal to h times f. In other words, the ratio of the energy and the frequency does not change due to a gradual change of the rope's length, and therefore this ratio is an adiabatic invariant. And indeed, in Einstein's quantum hypothesis, it is this quantity that is being quantized. This is an example of the adiabatic hypothesis. Variables that are quantized in quantum mechanics are adiabatic invariants in classical mechanics. Another example is Sommerfeld's quantization condition. Sommerfeld's quantization condition says that the integral of a particle's momentum over one period of its motion is quantized. This integral is called the action variable, and it is indeed known in classical Hamiltonian mechanics that the action variable is an adiabatic invariant. So we see that the adiabatic hypothesis establishes a link between the old classical mechanics and the new quantum mechanics.
A deeper understanding of the action variable will be helpful later when we further investigate the development of quantum mechanics and matrix mechanics. In Hamiltonian mechanics, there is a certain choice of coordinates, which are called the action angle coordinates. To understand what this means, let's briefly recall the basic concepts of Hamiltonian mechanics, which we've discussed in more detail in a previous video. Normally, one describes the positions of particles using Cartesian coordinates. That is, one can describe them with some coordinates x, y, z. And each position coordinate has a corresponding momentum coordinate, namely the momentum in the x, y, z directions. However, some systems are more conveniently described in a different coordinate system. For example, a rotationally symmetric system might be more easily described in polar or spherical coordinates. So more generally speaking, one can define a generalized position coordinate Q. The Cartesian coordinate X is one particular choice of coordinates. To find the equations of motion of a system in terms of the generalized coordinates, one can construct a Lagrangian, which is given by the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. If one chooses to describe the system in Cartesian coordinates, then the kinetic energy is given by the familiar expression 1 half times mass times velocity squared while the potential energy is some function of the Cartesian coordinates. To find the equation of motion from the Lagrangian, one applies Hamilton's principle of least action. That is, we integrate the Lagrangian over any possible path that the particle can take, and the path for which this integral is minimized is the path that the particle will actually take. This minimization problem is solved by the Euler-Lagrange formula from which one can define the generalized force and generalized momentum. We see that if we apply this definition of the generalized momentum to the Lagrangian expressed in Cartesian coordinates, we find the familiar expression for momentum, namely mass times velocity. However, the equations of motion can be written in a more symmetric way by transforming the Lagrangian into the Hamiltonian by applying a Legendre transform. When expressed in Cartesian coordinates, we find that the Hamiltonian is given by the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Therefore, the Hamiltonian can be interpreted as the total energy of the system. It can be shown that the equations of motion can now be expressed in the following symmetric way. The time derivative of the generalized position is given by the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the generalized momentum. The time derivative of the generalized momentum is given by minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the generalized position. When expressed in Cartesian coordinates, we recover the familiar equations from Newtonian mechanics. The momentum is mass times velocity, and the time derivative of momentum is equal to the applied force, which is equal to minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to position. Any set of position and momentum variables that satisfy Hamilton's equations of motion are called canonical variables. The action angle variables are an example of such canonical variables. The reason why the action angle variables are important to study is because the quantization conditions often involve the action variable. And by interpreting the action variable as a canonical variable in Hamiltonian mechanics, all the theorems that hold for canonical variables in general hold for the action angle variables in particular. We will refer to this result later, when discussing the relation between matrix mechanics and classical mechanics. To illustrate the concept of action angle variables, we consider the example of the harmonic oscillator, which has a quadratic potential energy function. The action angle variables are a choice of generalized coordinates, where the angle is a generalized position coordinate and the action is a generalized momentum coordinate. First, let's solve the harmonic oscillator in Cartesian coordinates. The position oscillates harmonically with a certain amplitude, and the momentum is given by the mass times the time derivative of the position. We can express the value of the Hamiltonian, or the total energy, in terms of the oscillation amplitude. Then, we can calculate the action integral as defined in Sommerfeld's quantization condition. We write the time derivative of position in terms of momentum, and then substitute the expression we found for the momentum, 
we then find the action in terms of the oscillation amplitude, which we can express in terms of the total energy. We thus found the Hamiltonian in terms of the action variable. What we're going to do now is assume that the action angle variables are canonical variables. That is, we assume that there is an angle variable that satisfies Hamilton's equation of motion. We can solve this equation of motion to find an explicit expression for the angle variable. With these definitions of the action variable and angle variable, we will verify that they indeed describe the time evolution of the system, and thereby confirm that they are indeed valid canonical variables. We have expressed the action and angle variables in terms of the oscillation amplitude and time. Therefore, we can express the solutions for the Cartesian position and momentum in terms of the action and angle variables. When we plug these solutions in the expression for the Hamiltonian, we find a result that is indeed consistent with our definitions. Therefore, the action angle variables describe the time evolution of the system and they are canonical variables because they satisfy Hamilton's equations of motion. Note that in the case of the harmonic oscillator, the action variable is the same adiabatic invariant that appeared in the discussion between Lorentz and Einstein on the pendulum with variable length. It is the total energy divided by the oscillation frequency that cannot be changed by gradual changes in the system, and therefore this quantity is quantized in quantum theory. The fact that the action angle variables are canonical variables will be used later when discussing the relation between matrix mechanics and classical mechanics. Another link between classical and quantum mechanics was given by Bohr's correspondence principle, which states that in the limit of high energies, the quantum theory should reduce to the classical theory. When Bohr developed his model of the atom, he assumed that when an electron transitions from one orbit to another, radiation is emitted with a frequency that depends on the difference in energy levels. This is in contradiction with classical theory which states that the radiation frequency should equal the electron's orbital frequency. However, Bohr also demonstrated that in the limit of high energy orbits, the radiation frequency predicted by quantum mechanics will coincide with the orbital frequency, as predicted by classical mechanics. One can take this logic of the correspondence principle even further. In our previous example, the electron's orbital frequency coincides with the radiation frequency if the electron drops down to the energy level directly below it. But what if the electron drops down not only one level, but two levels, or three? In that case, the radiation frequency is twice or three times the orbital frequency. How does the correspondence principle make sense of that? In classical theory, if an electron emits radiation with a frequency that is twice or three times the orbital frequency, then those frequencies must also be present in the electron's motion. This means that the electron's oscillation consists of some fundamental frequency and harmonics, which are integer multiples of this fundamental frequency. The presence of these harmonics describes an orbit that is not circular, but elliptical. The magnitudes of these harmonics determine the intensities of the spectral lines corresponding to those frequencies. In the quantum model, these intensities correspond to the transition probabilities between different energy levels, similar to Einstein's A and B coefficients. So the Fourier coefficients of a classical electron orbit should in some limit correspond to the transition probability amplitudes of the quantum model. This principle was used by Hendrik Kramers in his study of the intensity of spectral lines. Later, he would tackle the problem of dispersion in quantum mechanics using similar lines of reasoning. Moreover, the correspondence between Fourier coefficients and spectral line intensities will later play an important role in Heisenberg's development of matrix mechanics. One can derive from the correspondence principle another mathematical rule that will be used in developing matrix mechanics. Namely, we saw that in classical physics, the action variable equals the energy divided by the oscillation frequency, which is an adiabatic invariant. If the radiation frequency equals the electron's oscillation frequency, which is the case in the classical limit, then the radiation frequency can be found by taking the derivative of the energy 
with respect to the action variable. The harmonic oscillator oscillates with only a single frequency. But if we consider the higher harmonics of elliptical orbits, we can multiply the fundamental frequency with some integer. On the other hand, in quantum mechanics, the radiation frequency is given by the difference in energy levels divided by Planck's constant. Since according to Sommerfeld's quantization rule, the action variable is an integer multiple of Planck's constant, we can write the radiation frequency as a finite different quotient of energy and action. Therefore, the correspondence between classical theory and quantum theory is that the derivative of energy with respect to action becomes a finite difference quotient. These were some of the insights that were used to develop and make sense of quantum mechanics. Even though these rules are substantiated by some sort of logical reasoning, they do not form a completely coherent framework from which all the results of quantum mechanics can be derived systematically. Rather, the approach was to make educated guesses, guided by observations and analogies with classical mechanics. To find a coherent theoretical framework for quantum mechanics, developing a quantum mechanical model for dispersion served as an important stepping stone. So let's turn to the problem of describing dispersion with quantum mechanical principles. Again, the solution to this problem will be found by making educated guesses guided by the correspondence principle. But the final results yield insights that will profoundly inspire Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. First, let's recall what dispersion is and how it can be understood with classical physics. Dispersion is the phenomenon that the refractive index of a medium is different for light of different wavelengths. As a result, a prism can for example disperse white light into its different color components. This phenomenon was first studied well before the discovery of electrons. Therefore, an empirical formula for the refractive index as function of wavelength was found, namely the Selmayr equation, but it was not understood and derived from fundamental physical principles. Hendrik Lorentz developed a physical model for dispersion after the discovery of the electron. The model assumes that incident radiation makes an electron oscillate, and the oscillating electron again emits radiation that interferes with the incident field. The net result of summing all these fields is a field with a reduced wavelength and slower phase velocity, which is described by the refractive index of the medium. To quantitatively calculate how the refractive index depends on the wavelength of the incident field, we set up the equation of motion for the electron using Newton's second law. There are three forces acting on the electron. The first is the incident radiation, which is an oscillating electric field. Secondly, there is a dissipative force, which causes the electron oscillation to dampen out if there is no driving force anymore. Finally, we assume that the electron is a harmonic oscillator with some natural oscillation frequency. These three forces determine the electron's acceleration. We assume that the electron will oscillate with the same frequency as the incident radiation and plug this assumption into the differential equation. We can then straightforwardly solve for the oscillation amplitude of the electron as function of the frequency of the incident light. This displacement of the electron is related to the polarization of the medium, which is something different than the polarization of light. And from classical electrodynamic theory, this polarization can be related directly to the medium's refractive index. The formula that we then find for the refractive index as function of wavelength is of the same form as the empirical Selmayr equation. Therefore, we have found a classical model for dispersion. However, it is not immediately obvious how this classical result can be reinterpreted with quantum mechanical concepts. For example, by measuring the dispersion curve, one can identify the resonance frequencies of different dispersion electrons. In Lorentz's classical theory, these frequencies correspond to the natural oscillation frequencies of the electrons. However, measurements revealed that the resonance frequencies for dispersion correspond to the frequencies of the spectral lines, and we know from Bohr's model of the atom that these frequencies do not correspond to oscillation frequencies of the electron.
but rather to transitions between different electron energy levels. So how can we understand dispersion in terms of transitions between energy levels rather than electron oscillations? To answer that question, we compare the classical and quantum mechanical descriptions of radiation absorption and emission and make them match as prescribed by the correspondence principle. In classical theory, an oscillating electric field makes an electron oscillate due to the electric force. This is how an electron absorbs radiation. An accelerating electron emits radiation according to Larmor's formula. On the other hand, in quantum theory, radiation absorption and emission are described with Einstein's A and B coefficients. There are three such coefficients. One A coefficient for spontaneous emission and two B coefficients for stimulated emission and absorption. Spontaneous emission corresponds to the classical phenomenon that an oscillating electron spontaneously emits radiation according to Larmor's formula. Stimulated emission by itself does not have a clear classical analog. So let's calculate the value for Einstein's A coefficient by using Larmor's formula. Let's assume a charge is oscillating harmonically with some amplitude d. We can plug this expression into Larmor's formula and take the time average to find the time averaged emitted power. In quantum theory, this emission of power corresponds to the harmonic oscillator jumping from a certain energy level to the energy level below it. We can calculate the energy of the harmonic oscillator and then we set this energy equal to an integer multiple of Planck's constant h times the frequency f, as prescribed by quantum theory. This relates the oscillator amplitude d to the energy level of the harmonic oscillator n. We now found the emitted power as function of the energy level n of the quantum harmonic oscillator. To find the value of Einstein's a coefficient, we set the emitted power equal to a, the rate of photon emission, times Planck's constant times frequency, which is the energy of a single photon. Solving for A tells us how the rate of spontaneous photon emission depends on the energy level of the harmonic oscillator. Using the formula for blackbody radiation, Einstein had already described how the A coefficient for spontaneous emission relates to the B coefficients for absorption and stimulated emission. We use this relation to express the classical absorption rate in terms of quantum processes. Classically, an electron absorbs radiation energy by converting it to kinetic energy as it starts to oscillate. Since in this model there is no analog for stimulated emission, the classical absorption rate must be the net difference between quantum absorption and quantum stimulated emission. Therefore, the classical absorption rate corresponds to the difference of Einstein's B coefficients. Since we found the value for the A coefficient, and we know how the A coefficient relates to the B coefficients, we can straightforwardly find the net difference between the B coefficients. With this result, we can now rewrite Lorentz's classical dispersion formula in terms of quantum processes. The electron displacement should be directly proportional to the absorption rate, because the electron gets displaced by absorbing radiation. Therefore, we can write the formula in terms of the net absorption rate while preserving the magnitude of the electron displacement. This formula can be further simplified by cancelling out and collecting some factors. We now have expressed the electron displacement in terms of quantum processes namely Einstein's B coefficients for absorption and stimulated emission. To relate this to the refractive index of a medium, we first calculate the induced polarization of the medium, which is given by the number of electrons n times the electron charge q times the electron displacement. The formula we now find assumes that the electron oscillates harmonically with a single frequency, which means that only transitions between adjacent energy levels can occur. However, we have seen that when an electron moves in an elliptical orbit, its motion contains higher harmonics, which means that, quantum mechanically, higher order transitions can take place. Therefore, a more complete formula includes these higher order transitions.
This formula can be written either in terms of B coefficients or A coefficients. We have now come up with a formula for dispersion that makes similar predictions as Lorentz's classical dispersion formula, but the new dispersion formula is based on quantum transitions between energy levels to make it consistent with the observation of spectral lines. This is the dispersion formula that was found by Hendrik Kramers. Although one can include a factor of one-third to account for the random orientation of atoms in a material. Now the question is, what is the physical interpretation of this formula? The formula resembles Lorentz's classical formula for an oscillating electron, except now you have a sum of many oscillators corresponding to different electron transitions. And some oscillators have negative weights. These oscillators have been interpreted as virtual oscillators, meaning that they are more of a helpful mental picture to interpret the formulas rather than physically existing objects. This summation over all transition rates obeys a certain constraint, which is called the thomas reiche kuhn sum rule. It was discovered as follows. Before the development of the quantum formula for dispersion, J.J. Thomson, who had discovered the electron, had derived a formula for the energy that is dispersed by an electron. He had derived this formula by assuming just a single oscillator, and this formula was proven to be valid in X-ray dispersion experiments. However, according to the quantum formula for dispersion, the energy dispersed by an electron should not be calculated assuming a single oscillator, but rather many virtual oscillators. But since Thomson's formula had already been proven to be accurate, this sum of virtual oscillators should be equivalent to a single oscillator. This extra constraint is described as a sum rule. Let's see what this sum rule says exactly. We have derived an expression for the polarization of a single oscillator. For high radiation frequencies, such as X-ray frequencies, we can neglect the electron's natural oscillation frequency. In the quantum formula, we have a sum over many virtual oscillators. And also here we can apply the approximation for high frequencies. These two expressions should be equal to each other, which results in a sum rule. Currently, the sum rule is expressed in terms of Einstein's A coefficients. However, as we will see later, it will be helpful to rewrite this sum rule in terms of the Fourier coefficients of an oscillator. So let's see how Einstein's A coefficients relate to the Fourier coefficients of an oscillator. Let's again assume a harmonic oscillator with amplitude d. If we write this function as a sum of Fourier components, we find that each Fourier coefficient has an amplitude of d over 2. To relate these Fourier coefficients to Einstein's A coefficient, we recall the expression for the time averaged emitted power, which follows from Larmor's formula. We equate this to the rate of spontaneous emission times the photon energy, and with this we can express Einstein's A coefficient in terms of the Fourier coefficients of an oscillator. Now we can substitute this expression for Einstein's A coefficient into the sum rule and then simplify it to find our final expression for the thomas reiche kuhn sum rule. We will see later how this sum rule plays an important role in Heisenberg's development of matrix mechanics. By now we have obtained quite a few insights on quantum theory. The quantum formula for dispersion tells us that an electron can be modeled as a collection of virtual oscillators, whose oscillation frequencies correspond to the spectral frequencies which can be directly observed experimentally. From Bohr's correspondence principle, we deduced that the transition rates between quantum energy levels correspond to Fourier coefficients of classical electron orbits. Moreover, we found that when in classical theory we take derivatives with respect to the action variable, in quantum mechanics it becomes a finite difference quotient. Furthermore, we know Sommerfeld's quantization rule, which says that the action integral must be an integer multiple of Planck's constant, and we know the TRK sum rule, which puts a constraint on the sum of transition rates. Now the question is, how do we construct a coherent theory of quantum mechanics from all these separate rules?
In the following, we will see how these insights led to the development of matrix mechanics, the first coherent theory of quantum mechanics. Let's start with the question, how do we describe the motion of an electron? Classically, we can define its position as a function of time. This can be expressed as a sum of Fourier coefficients, and these coefficients represent how strongly the electron emits radiation of a certain frequency. Since the position of an electron must ultimately be real valued, the coefficients for negative frequencies must be the complex conjugate of coefficients for positive frequencies. In quantum theory, however, it was found that the frequency of emitted radiation is in general not given by the frequency of the electron's motion, but by the difference between electrons' energy levels. Only in the limit of high quantum numbers do the two coincide. Quantum dispersion theory revealed that the electrons can be better thought of as a collection of virtual oscillators, whose oscillation frequencies are not related to the orbital motion of the electron, but to the energy differences in electron transitions. Einstein's B coefficients for stimulated transition rates are directly related to the amplitudes of these oscillators. Thus, instead of a sum of Fourier components, we now have a collection of virtual oscillators. In the limit of high quantum numbers, the two are related in the following way. The frequency of a virtual oscillator corresponds to a harmonic of the electron's classical orbit, and the amplitude of that virtual oscillator corresponds to the Fourier coefficient of the classical orbit. So the first step in Heisenberg's development of a coherent quantum theory is to turn a sum of Fourier harmonics into a collection of virtual oscillators and recognizing that they become the same in the limit of high quantum numbers. Then the question is, how do we perform calculations with a collection of virtual oscillators? For example, it's straightforward to multiply one sum with another sum. But what does it even physically mean to multiply one collection with another collection? Here we use the fact that the two must be the same in the limit of high quantum numbers. So first, let's see what happens when we multiply one Fourier sum with another Fourier sum. It is a well-known theorem that if you multiply two functions, you take a convolution of their Fourier transforms. So what happens when we identify the Fourier coefficients with the amplitudes of the virtual oscillators? When we multiply two collections of virtual oscillators, then the amplitude of a resulting virtual oscillator should be the same as the Fourier coefficient of a product of Fourier sums. We saw that this Fourier coefficient is given by a convolution. We can rewrite this convolution by a change of the summation index and then identify the Fourier coefficients with virtual oscillator amplitudes. We thus end up with a rule that tells us how to multiply collections of virtual oscillator amplitudes. This rule happens to describe matrix multiplication. Heisenberg did not recognize this, because at the time matrices were not commonly used in physics. But Max Born did recognize this as the rule for matrix multiplication, and so the concept of matrix mechanics was founded. So in quantum mechanics, the position of an electron is not a sum, but a matrix of oscillators. Each element specifies the amplitude with which radiation of a certain frequency is emitted. Since radiation is emitted as a discrete quantum whenever the electron transitions from one energy level to another, the oscillator amplitude denotes the rate at which such a transition takes place. Therefore, the amplitude is directly related to Einstein's B coefficients. In the classical limit, this amplitude corresponds to a Fourier component of a well-defined sharp orbit. Each row of matrix elements corresponds to all the transitions from one initial energy level. We saw that higher order transitions from a certain orbit correspond in the classical limit to higher harmonics of that orbit. Therefore, one row of the matrix can be interpreted as all the Fourier components of one orbit. If the matrix were to describe a single sharp classical orbit, then all the rows would be identical, except they would be shifted so that all the constant terms would be on the diagonal. Such a matrix would be Hermitian 
because the Fourier components of a classical orbit should describe a real valued function. It stands then to reason that the quantum mechanical matrix that describes multiple different orbits would be Hermitian as well. Also because we already know that Einstein's coefficients for absorption and stimulated emission are equal in magnitude. We now know that in quantum mechanics we describe an electron's position with a matrix. And we know some of the properties of such a matrix. But what does it physically mean to describe a position as a matrix? We can easily sketch an orbit that is described by a scalar function of time, but how do we visualize an orbit that is described by a matrix that changes in time? Heisenberg himself said in his Nobel lecture that to describe the electron in a way that is consistent with the observation of spectral lines, we have to forego a visual description of the atom. That is, matrix mechanics is a logically coherent theory with which we can make accurate predictions of experimental results, but it is fundamentally unintuitive. So we have turned the position of an electron from a scalar to a matrix. In the classical scalar case, the time evolution of the electron's position is described by Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. Or alternatively, you could describe the time evolution by using Hamilton's equations of motion. But what law describes the time evolution of the electron's position now that the position is described by a matrix? Since we already know how the matrix depends on time, we can straightforwardly calculate its time derivative. Each matrix element gets multiplied by a difference in energy levels. We can express this matrix differently by defining a diagonal matrix H that contains all the energy levels along its diagonal. This matrix is called the Hamiltonian matrix. We calculate the matrix elements of the commutator of the Hamiltonian matrix and the position matrix. We write out the definition of matrix multiplication and then plug in the definition of the Hamiltonian matrix. When we calculate the sum by using the property of the delta function, we find that each matrix element of the position matrix is multiplied by a difference in energy levels, which is exactly what we found when taking the time derivative of the position matrix. Therefore, we obtain the Heisenberg equation of motion, which says that the time derivative of the matrix of an observable is given by the commutator with the Hamiltonian matrix. A very important result of the old quantum theory was Sommerfeld's quantization condition. How does this condition manifest itself in the framework of matrix mechanics? Since the matrices in matrix mechanics are closely related to the Fourier coefficients of classical orbits, let's first rewrite Sommerfeld's quantization condition in terms of Fourier coefficients. We can write down the Fourier expansions for the position and the momentum, and then plug them into the quantization condition. This gives an integral over a complex exponential, which reduces to a delta function. This delta function allows us to eliminate one summation. Finally, we change the lower limit of the summation from negative infinity to zero. We have now rewritten Sommerfeld's quantization condition in terms of Fourier coefficients. To further rewrite this condition, Heisenberg took on both sides of the equation the derivative with respect to n. Then he applied the result that followed from the correspondence principle namely that the derivative of energy with respect to the action integral in classical mechanics becomes a finite different quotient in quantum mechanics. We first apply this result to a times the fundamental frequency omega zero. This product equals a harmonic frequency, which we know in quantum mechanics corresponds to a higher order transition. So this harmonic frequency can be written as the difference between two energy levels divided by the reduced Planck's constant. This difference in energy levels can be approximated using a derivative of energy with respect to the quantum number n. We now have obtained an expression where twice a derivative is applied to the energy. According to the correspondence principle, taking the derivative twice corresponds to taking the finite difference of a finite difference. We can rewrite this as a difference of frequencies for different transitions between energy levels. If this is the correspondence rule for taking the derivative with respect to frequency, then we can make an educated guess for the correspondence rule for taking the derivative with respect to frequency times the Fourier amplitude. 
we end up with an expression involving the quantum transition amplitudes, or matrix elements, that is the same as the TRK sum rule that had been found previously. This was for Heisenberg an indication that this is the correct way to incorporate Sommerfeld's quantization condition into the framework of matrix mechanics. Shortly after, Born and Jordan came up with a different way to formulate this condition. In their approach, they used the generalized position and momentum coordinates, and therefore did not assume that the momentum equals the mass times the time derivative of position. The procedure is similar to what we saw before. We plug the Fourier expansions of the momentum and position into the quantization condition. The integral reduces to a delta function, which turns the double summation into a single sum. We take the derivative with respect to the quantum number n, and then turn the derivative into a finite difference by using the result from the correspondence principle. By changing the summation index, we recognize the sum to be a matrix multiplication. More precisely, we find that the diagonal elements of the commutator of the momentum matrix and the position matrix all have the same constant value. So we found that the diagonal values of the commutator of the momentum and position matrix follow from Sommerfeld's quantization condition. But what are the values of all the other elements of the commutator? Born had a hunch that these off-diagonal elements must be zero, but he didn't know how to prove this. Eventually, Jordan did manage to prove this result. A simplified version of this proof goes as follows. Assuming that all energy levels are different, a matrix is constant in time when it is diagonal. So let's calculate the time derivative of the commutator of the momentum and position matrix. We assume that the Hamiltonian is given by the kinetic energy, which is a function of momentum, and the potential energy, which is a function of position. When we plug Hamilton's equations of motion into the expression for the time derivative of the commutator, we find that all terms depend only on position or only on momentum. Since the position matrix commutes with itself, and so does the momentum matrix, we find that the time derivative of the commutator of momentum and position vanishes, which means it is a diagonal matrix. This is a central result of matrix mechanics. The commutator of the position matrix and momentum matrix yields a constant times the identity matrix. It is called the canonical commutation relation. It tells us how matrix mechanics fundamentally differs from classical mechanics, where all quantities commute with each other. And it encapsulates Sommerfeld's quantization condition, which was a cornerstone of the old quantum theory. These are some of the most important results of matrix mechanics, as derived by Heisenberg, Born and Jordan. However, after Heisenberg's initial publication, Paul Dirac also independently derived several of these results. It's worth examining these alternative derivations, as they yield additional helpful insights into matrix mechanics. We start with this question. Now that we've changed all scalar quantities into matrices, how do we take derivatives? What does it mean to take a derivative of one matrix with respect to another matrix? To answer this question, we state two conditions that this operation should satisfy. First, the operator should be linear. Second, the operator should satisfy the product rule. Let's first address the first condition. The fact that the operator is linear implies that it can be described using impulse responses. That is, if we consider a single element of the input matrix, then applying the derivative operator yields an output matrix that is directly proportional to the value of the input. In case the input element has value 1, we call the output matrix the impulse response. If we then consider an arbitrary input matrix that contains many non-zero elements, the output matrix can be calculated by summing together the impulse responses with the appropriate weights. Therefore, the derivative operator can be written as a weighted sum of impulse responses. The question that we then need to answer is what the impulse response looks like. To do that, we impose the second condition, namely that the product rule should hold. This product rule should hold for any arbitrary input matrices U and V. Therefore, 
to see what condition the product rule imposes on the impulse response A, we can consider a bunch of choices for U and V and plug them into the product rule equation. A particularly convenient choice for U and V are matrices which have only one non-zero element, which we can think of as an impulse. When we plug this choice into the product rule equation and write the derivative operator as the sum of impulse responses, then we can use the delta functions to eliminate the summations. This leaves us with an equation that imposes a constraint on the form of the impulse response A. But what does this constraint tell us exactly about the impulse response of the derivative operator? To see this, we consider all possible combinations of the delta functions being 1 or 0. For example, if all delta functions are 0, we obtain the condition that 0 equals 0, which is trivial. A non-trivial condition is obtained when we choose one delta function to be 1. We can rewrite this condition in such a way that it automatically accounts for the fact that this condition only holds when certain indices are equal to each other. From this condition, two other conditions also follow, so they don't have to be examined separately. There is another condition which states that if the first and third indices of the impulse response are equal to each other, then it doesn't matter what their values are the impulse response will be the same either way. This means that we can write the impulse response as function of only the second and fourth index. Similarly, another condition allows us to write the impulse response as function of only the first and third index. We can use these double index functions whenever the second and fourth index of the impulse response are equal, or when the first and third index of the impulse response are equal. The final condition 2 can be written in terms of these double index functions. Now let's see if we can reduce this list of conditions to a concise description of what the impulse response of the derivative operator looks like. We start with an expression for the impulse response that follows directly from one of the conditions that we formulated. We rewrite the delta functions in this expression so that we can plug in three of the other conditions that we found. We can collect the terms containing the product of the two delta functions. Because of the delta functions, we can change the indices from capital M and N to lowercase m and n. The resulting terms cancel each other out, so that we are left with a compact expression for the impulse response of a derivative operator. This expression contains two different functions of two indices. We can relate these two functions to each other to simplify this expression even further. In case capital N does not equal lowercase n, we see that one function equals the negative of the other. In case capital N equals lowercase n, we use three times the fact that the quadruple index impulse response equals the sum of the double index functions. It follows that in this case too, one function equals the negative of the other. Therefore, we can write the quadruple index impulse response in terms of only a single double index function. But what does this expression exactly mean? If we write the derivative as the sum of impulse responses, and we plug in the expression for the impulse response that we found, then we can use the delta functions to reduce the double summation to a single summation, and then we recognize in this single summation a matrix multiplication. We thus find that taking the derivative of a matrix with respect to another matrix means calculating the commutator of the input matrix with respect to some other matrix, which will depend on the matrix with respect to which we take the derivative. So we found that the commutator plays an important role in quantum mechanics, and that depending on the matrix with which we take the commutator, it can represent a derivative. But can we find an even stronger correspondence between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics? Does the commutator in quantum mechanics have a clear analogue in classical mechanics? First. Let's recall how a quantum mechanical quantity differs from a classical quantity. The position of an electron as a function of time describes in classical mechanics a single well-defined orbit. If we were to describe this quantity as a matrix, it would contain the Fourier coefficients of this orbit. A single row of the matrix would contain all the Fourier coefficients of that single orbit, and all other rows are identical but shifted. This is so to guarantee that if you multiply two matrix quantities defined in this way, you convolve the Fourier coefficients, as is required by the convolution theorem. 
Because of this structure, the matrix is constant in the diagonal direction. Moreover, matrices of this kind commute with each other, because their multiplication is equivalent to a multiplication of two scalar functions. Whereas the classical position describes a single well-defined electron orbit, the quantum mechanical position matrix describes all possible transitions between different orbits. Since for high quantum numbers all possible transitions starting from one fixed orbit correspond to the Fourier coefficients of that orbit, we can say that each row of the position matrix contains the Fourier coefficients of an orbit. Note that different rows correspond to different orbits, as opposed to the classical case where all rows contain the same Fourier coefficients of a single orbit. Because of this, two quantum mechanical matrices do not commute. Therefore, the fact that a quantum commutator is non-zero comes from the variation along the diagonal direction of the matrix, which in turn comes from the variation in Fourier coefficients for different orbits. This means that in order to find an analogue of the quantum commutator in classical physics, we have to look at the difference between Fourier coefficients of different orbits. Recall that the different orbits are defined by the quantum number n in Sommerfeld's quantization condition. Therefore, the change in the Fourier coefficients between orbits can be expressed by using the derivative with respect to the action variable j. With this result, we can turn the classical matrix into a quantum mechanical matrix by including these derivatives that describe the variation of Fourier coefficients between different orbits. Note that in quantum theory, the harmonic frequencies of the Fourier series correspond to some transition between energy levels. With this in mind, let us now look at the expression for the quantum commutator and see if we can relate it to some classical quantity. We can write out the definition of the commutator and pull the time-dependent factors outside of the summation. We then add a term and subtract the same term so that we have a difference of matrix elements. We can change the summation index and then rewrite the second matrix index by introducing a delta function. In the resulting expression, we find a difference of matrix elements along the diagonal direction. Recall that this variation along the diagonal direction distinguished a quantum mechanical position matrix from a classical position matrix, because the quantum matrix considers multiple electron orbits, whereas the classical matrix considers only one. We found that the variation along the diagonal direction can be expressed as a derivative of the Fourier coefficient with respect to the action variable. Next, we pull the time-dependent factor back into the summation and we distribute it over the Fourier coefficients of the x and y matrices. Recall from our earlier discussion on the action angle variables that we can substitute the time variable with the angle variable. We now recognize the derivative with respect to the angle variable and we can reinterpret the Fourier terms as time-dependent matrix elements. Finally, we write the summation as a matrix multiplication and we obtain an expression which in classical Hamiltonian mechanics is known as the Poisson bracket. The Poisson bracket has the same value for any choice of canonical coordinates p and q. And as we recall from our earlier discussion on action angle variables, the action angle variables are indeed canonical coordinates. We can now check whether this result is consistent with what we found earlier. First of all, it is straightforwardly shown that the time derivative of a variable is found by taking its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. According to our most recent result, this should correspond to a commutator in quantum mechanics. And indeed, this is exactly what we found with Heisenberg's equation of motion. Furthermore, we found that a commutator corresponds to taking a derivative. If we compare the quantum mechanical Heisenberg's equation of motion to the classical Hamiltonian equations of motion, we find that, indeed, taking the commutator with the position matrix corresponds to taking the derivative with respect to momentum, and taking the commutator with the momentum matrix corresponds to taking the derivative with respect to position. All these results are consistent with the canonical commutation relation as well. Consider the commutator of the position and momentum matrices. A commutator with the momentum matrix corresponds to a derivative with respect to position. This yields the canonical commutation relation.
we can obtain the same result by interpreting a commutator with a position matrix as a derivative with respect to momentum. We could also use the result that the commutator corresponds to the Poisson bracket. This too yields the canonical commutation relation. Finally, we can note that taking a derivative of a scalar position function satisfies the same recursive relation as taking the commutator of the position matrix with the momentum matrix. One can therefore prove via induction, together with the canonical commutation relation as the induction hypothesis, that taking the commutator with the momentum matrix yields the same result as taking the derivative with respect to position. This is how Heisenberg, Born, Jordan and Dirac constructed a coherent quantum theory which incorporates many of the ad hoc quantization rules of the old quantum theory. But the ultimate test of the validity of this new theory of matrix mechanics was to use it to rederive the well-established results that the old quantum theory had found for the hydrogen atom. So let's recap some of the things that were already well known before the development of matrix mechanics. A lot of important insights into the structure of the hydrogen atom were encapsulated in Sommerfeld's atomic model. In this model, the orbit of an electron is described by three parameters. One parameter is the energy of the electron, which relates to the size of the orbit. The larger the orbit, the higher the energy. The second parameter is the angular momentum of the electron, which determines the shape of the orbit. The smaller the angular momentum of the electron, the more elliptical the orbit is. The third and final parameter is the z-component of the angular momentum vector. This determines the spatial orientation of the electron orbit. If the z-component of the angular momentum vector is maximal, then the electron is orbiting in the xy-plane. And if the z-component is reduced, then the orbit gets tilted with respect to the z-axis. There are many different orbits that have the same energy. For example, orbits of different shapes can have the same energy and changing the spatial orientation of an orbit doesn't change its energy either. When there are multiple different orbits that have the same energy, then we say that that energy level is degenerate. In the quantum theory, where Sommerfeld's quantization condition is applied, these three parameters correspond to three quantum numbers. In this case, the degeneracy of energy levels means that for each energy quantum number, there are multiple angular momentum quantum numbers. And for each angular momentum quantum number, there are multiple quantum numbers for the z component of the angular momentum vector. If we want to demonstrate the validity of matrix mechanics, we should be able to derive with it the existence of these quantum numbers. Another phenomenon that was already explained before the development of matrix mechanics is the normal Zeeman effect. Light emitted by a certain chemical element can be separated into different spectral lines. When the light source is put in a magnetic field, then a single spectral line can split in three. The three different lines are observed to have different polarizations. If the lines are viewed from a direction that is perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, then the polarizations are linear. If the lines are viewed from a direction that is parallel to the magnetic field, then the central line disappears and the two outer lines are circularly polarized in opposite directions. Lorentz succeeded in explaining these observations by considering the motion of oscillating electrons subject to the Lorentz force, which is due to the applied magnetic field. The equation of motion is solved by decomposing the electron's oscillation into rotations in the xy-plane perpendicular to the magnetic field and linear oscillations in the z-direction parallel to the magnetic field. Under the influence of the magnetic field, the frequencies of these three oscillations will change, resulting in three spectral lines with different polarizations. This result too, we should be able to reproduce with matrix mechanics. In the following, we'll sketch an outline of how matrix mechanics is able to reproduce these results from the old quantum theory. First, let's see what sort of physical quantities are used in matrix mechanics. In classical mechanics, we use three-dimensional vectors, such as the position vector and the angular momentum vector. In matrix mechanics, each element of such a vector becomes a matrix. Therefore, we work with vectors of matrices, 
the squared length of such a vector also becomes a matrix. It is given by the sum of the squares of its elements, and the square of one element is calculated according to the law of matrix multiplication. A cross product of two vectors is also calculated using matrix multiplications for each element. When performing calculations with these quantities, the following rule is important to keep in mind. A position coordinate does not commute with its corresponding momentum component, but it does commute with everything else. With these definitions and rules in mind, let's see how we can explain the normal Zeeman effect. First, we write down the definition of the angular momentum vector of an electron. We will consider the commutator of the z-position with the z-component of the angular momentum vector. This commutator equals zero, because the z-position commutes with everything except the z-component of the linear momentum. If we apply a magnetic field in the z-direction, then the z-component of the angular momentum remains conserved in time, because the system retains its symmetry around the z-axis. However, the energy of the electron will start to depend on the z-component of its angular momentum vector. That is, the energy of the electron will start to depend on the spatial orientation of its orbit, so that the energy degeneracy is lifted. Because Lz is conserved in time, and different Lz correspond to different energies, it follows that the matrix is diagonal. This allows us to rewrite the expression for the commutator with the z-coordinate, which we already know to be zero. We take note of this result and refer back to it later when we discuss what this means for the spectral lines in the normal Zeeman effect. Next, we consider the commutator of the z-component of the angular momentum vector with the x-position and y-position. The x-position commutes with everything except the x-momentum. We use the canonical commutation relation to obtain the final result. Similarly, the y-position commutes with everything except the y-momentum, and they also obey the canonical commutation relation. Using the fact that the LZ matrix is diagonal, we can rewrite these results in terms of the diagonal elements of LZ. We again take note of these results, and we'll refer back to them later. We can derive one more result from these expressions. We can rewrite them to eliminate either x or y from the equation. This leads to an important condition for the diagonal values of Lz. Now let's see what all the results that we've obtained tell us about the spectral lines. We see that if there's a transition where the z component of the electron's angular momentum does not change, the virtual oscillator does not oscillate in the x or y direction. Therefore, it must oscillate in the z direction, which means the light is z polarized. If the z component of the angular momentum does change during a transition, then it must change by the reduced Planck's constant h bar. In that case, the virtual oscillator does not oscillate in the z direction, which means it must oscillate in the xy plane. Moreover, we see that the oscillations in the x and y directions are of equal magnitude and plus or minus 90 degrees out of phase. Therefore, the light is left or right circularly polarized. These results are in line with what is observed in the normal Zeeman effect, as explained by Lorentz using classical methods. There are only three changes in LZ possible, and indeed only three lines are observed. These lines have different polarizations. If there is no change in LZ, then the polarization of the light is parallel to the magnetic field. If there is a change in LZ, then the light is left or right circularly polarized in the plane perpendicular to the applied magnetic field. Moreover, these results hint at the existence of quantum numbers. The Z component of the angular momentum vector indicates the orientation of the electron's orbit, and the results suggest that this value is quantized in units of h bar. With some extra work, Born, Heisenberg and Jordan showed that this is indeed the case, and thus they demonstrated the existence of the quantum number for the z-component of the angular momentum. Finally, we're going to look at whether matrix mechanics can reproduce the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. The full derivation is very elaborate, so here we will focus only on several key points that outline the line of thought of the derivation. We will follow the derivation by Wolfgang Pauli, 
although there is also another derivation by Paul Dirac. In his derivation, Pauli used a quantity called the Runge Lenz vector, which was already known in classical mechanics. So first, let's see what this vector does in classical mechanics, before we apply it to the quantum mechanical problem. We consider the Kepler problem, where one particle orbits another due to an attractive inverse square law force, in the same way that planets orbit the Sun. The Hamiltonian is given by the sum of the kinetic energy and potential energy, and the attractive force is proportional to the inverse square of the distance between the particles. Since we have a central force, angular momentum is conserved. For such a problem, we can define the Runge Lenz vector. This vector is constant in time, as we will demonstrate in the following. To demonstrate that the Runge Lenz vector is constant in time, we calculate its time derivative and show that it is equal to zero. First we apply the product rule to the cross product. The time derivative of the angular momentum vanishes because angular momentum is conserved in the presence of a central force. The time derivative of momentum is equal to the force. The time derivative of the normalized coordinate vector can be calculated by applying the product rule and the chain rule. We can plug in the definition of the angular momentum and the expression for the force. The time derivative of position is velocity, and the time derivative of the length of the coordinate vector can be calculated by writing the vector's length as the square root of the dot product with itself. The cross products can be rewritten using the vector triple product identity. Then we can cancel out terms to find that the end result is zero. Another important property of the Runge Lenz vector is that its length can be related to the particle's energy. To calculate the squared length of the vector, we take the inner product with itself and write out all the terms. We can apply a vector identity to the first term and change the order of vector multiplication in the third term. The angular momentum vector is perpendicular to the linear momentum vector, so their dot product vanishes. The dot product of a vector with itself is its squared length. We can recognize the definition of the angular momentum vector and then rearrange the terms. We recognize the expression for the Hamiltonian, or total energy, so we end up with a result that relates the length of the Runge Lenz vector to the energy and angular momentum. Note that any time-dependent variable, such as position or linear momentum, has been eliminated. Now we want to construct a similar Runge Lenz vector that can be used in matrix mechanics. Before we find such a vector, let's first demonstrate that in matrix mechanics too, the angular momentum vector is constant. According to the Heisenberg equation of motion, this means that the angular momentum vector must commute with the Hamiltonian. This implies that the angular momentum vector must commute with the square length of the momentum vector and with the length of the position vector. If something commutes with r, then it also commutes with 1 over r, because 1 over r can be expressed in powers of r. First, let's look at the commutator with the square of the total momentum. We recall the definition of the angular momentum vector, and note that the squared momentum commutes with all the components of the momentum vector. Therefore, to find the commutator of the squared momentum with the angular momentum vector, we only have to look at the commutator with the position matrices. The x-position commutes with everything except the x-component of the momentum vector. So we write out the commutator of x with px squared, and we can add and subtract a term so that we can apply the canonical commutation relation twice. We can now calculate the commutator of the x-component of the angular momentum with the squared momentum. Using the result we just found, we find the commutator and see that the terms cancel out to give a final result of zero. The same results hold for the other components of the angular momentum vector. So we find that the angular momentum vector commutes with the squared momentum, which is what we needed to demonstrate. For the second part, we need to find the commutator of the angular momentum with the length of the position vector. Since the length of the position vector is a function of only position matrices, it commutes with all position matrices. 
Therefore, we only have to consider the commutators with the components of the momentum vector. To calculate these, we recall that taking a commutator with a momentum matrix is equivalent to taking the derivative with respect to position. So we write the commutator as a derivative, which we can straightforwardly calculate. If we apply this result to the components of the angular momentum vector, we can calculate the commutator and find that the two terms cancel out, resulting in a commutator of zero. This result holds for all components of the angular momentum vector. So the angular momentum commutes with the length of the position vector. And because 1 over r can be expressed in powers of r, it also commutes with the angular momentum vector. With this result we have now demonstrated that also in matrix mechanics the angular momentum vector is constant in time. Now we return to the main question, how to find the quantum mechanical equivalent of the Runge lens vector. More specifically, we require that such a vector remains constant in time. To find such a vector, we calculate the time derivative of the normalized position vector and see what other term is required to cancel out this time derivative. We consider the x component of this normalized vector and calculate its time derivative by taking the commutator with the Hamiltonian, as prescribed by the Heisenberg equation of motion. Since the normalized position vector commutes with all position matrices, we only have to consider the commutator with the squared momentum. We can write down the commutator and then add and subtract a term so that we can identify two commutators. This commutator with the momentum vector can be interpreted as a derivative with respect to position. So we replace the commutator with derivatives and then calculate these derivatives. We take the dot product with the momentum vector and then recall the definition of the angular momentum vector. We see that we can write our previous expression in terms of components of the angular momentum vector. The new expression can be written as the first component of a cross product. We can rewrite this using the definition of the force. The force is the time derivative of momentum and since the angular momentum vector is constant in time, we can pull the time derivative outside the brackets. This is the result we get for the first term, where we take the dot product with the momentum vector from the left. For the second term, where we take the dot product with the momentum vector from the right, we find a similar result, except with a sign change, and the order of the cross product is reversed. We have now found the time derivative of the normalized position vector, if we cancel out this result with another term, then we have defined a vector that is constant in time. This is the Roman lens vector for the quantum mechanical case. Note the difference between the classical Runge lens vector and the quantum Runge lens vector. The single cross product has been replaced by half the difference between two cross products, where the order of the product is swapped. The order of the cross product matters in quantum mechanics, because quantities don't necessarily commute. Now we will see how this quantum Runge lens vector relates to the energy of the electron. We saw that in the classical case, we could relate the squared length of the Runge lens vector to the energy. Now that we have found the quantum mechanical Runge lens vector, how do we relate it to the energy? Before we answer that question, we're first going to rewrite the quantum Runge lens vector so that it is easier to calculate with. We can write the difference between cross products as a single cross product plus the momentum vector. Let's see why this is true. We consider the cross product of angular momentum and linear momentum. Using the definition of the angular momentum vector, we can write out the cross product. We can do the same for the cross product where the order of multiplication is reversed. We can collect some terms if we switch the order of some factors and introduce some commutators. In the final result, we recognize the cross product of the angular momentum with linear momentum. And if we apply the canonical commutation relation, we find the linear momentum vector. This allows us to rewrite the quantum Runge lens vector in a more convenient way.
To see how this factor relates to the energy of the electron, we calculate its squared length, just like in the classical case. Writing out this dot product yields several terms and cross terms. There are more terms compared to the classical case, due to the extra term in the quantum runge lenz vector, and the fact that several terms cannot be collected, because matrices in general don't commute. We will consider these terms one by one, and see how they can be simplified. First, we consider the dot product of the two cross products. Recall that in the classical case, we applied a vector identity, where the last term vanishes because the angular momentum vector is perpendicular to the linear momentum vector. In the quantum mechanical case, we have to be more careful when changing the order of multiplications, so let's work out this expression step by step. We write out the cross product, and then write down all the terms of the dot product. We collect all the terms with a positive sign, and all the terms with a negative sign, and then we add and subtract some terms. In the classical case, where all factors commute, we recognize the positive terms to be the product of two dot products, and the negative terms as another product of two other dot products. In the quantum mechanical case, we have to introduce commutators whenever we switch the order of multiplication. So we rewrite the positive terms by using commutators, and we do the same for the negative terms. In both cases, we can recognize a product of dot products, just like in the classical case. However, in addition to these terms, we also have a bunch of terms that include commutators. To calculate these commutators, we recall the definition of the angular momentum vector. The x component of the angular momentum does not depend on the x position, so it commutes with the x component of the linear momentum. But when we commute the x component of the angular momentum with the y component of the linear momentum, then we have to apply the canonical commutation relation to commute the y momentum with the y position. If we calculate all the commutators in this way, we find that all the terms cancel each other out, giving a net result of zero. In the same way, we can calculate the other collection of commutators, and in this case too, we find that the terms cancel out to give a net result of zero. Therefore, also in the quantum mechanical case, we can reduce the dot product of two cross products to two products of dot products. By recalling the definition of the angular momentum vector, we see that just like in the classical case, the dot product with the linear momentum vector vanishes. Therefore, we can simplify this term in the same way as in the classical case. Now let's move on to the second expression. In the classical case, we'd be able to collect these two terms because it doesn't matter whether you take the dot product on the left or on the right. To see what happens in the quantum mechanical case, we write out the cross product of angular momentum and linear momentum and plug in the definition of the angular momentum vector. Next, we consider the difference of the dot products instead of the sum. This can be written as the sum of the commutators for each vector component. If we consider the x component, which is commuted with the x momentum, only the terms containing the x position yield a non-zero contribution to the commutator via the canonical commutation relation. When we collect all the terms, we find the squared length of the momentum vector. Now let's consider a single term of this expression. We plug in the expression for the cross product and write out all the terms of the dot product. We can collect all the terms that cancel each other out to find that the total result equals zero. Combining these two equations yields the final result that this expression is non-zero, even though classically it would be zero. The third expression that we consider would classically reduce to minus two times the angular momentum squared divided by the length of the position vector. Anticipating that the quantum mechanical result will look similar to this, we recall the definition of the angular momentum vector so that we can write down the expression for its squared length, which we will use later for comparison. We write out the cross product of the angular momentum vector with the linear momentum vector, and then calculate its commutator with the position vector. We write down each term of the dot product, and then evaluate the commutators by using the canonical commutation relation. We collect the terms to find twice the dot product of the position vector with the momentum vector. Now let's consider a single term of the commutator. We write out all the terms of the dot product, and then compare them to the terms of the squared length of the angular momentum vector, 
to find that these expressions are equal to each other except for a minus sign. Combining these two results gives an expression for the second term of the commutator. Now we note that the two terms in the original expression are multiplied by 1 over r, one from the right side and one from the left side. We already demonstrated that the angular momentum vector commutes with 1 over r, so for the l squared terms it does not matter whether we multiply with 1 over r from the left or from the right. But 1 over r does not commute with the momentum vector. So here we have to take proper care that we multiply with 1 over r from the left side. We find the final result by adding the two terms, and we find that this result differs from the classical result by one additional term. We now consider the fourth and final expression. Classically, the order of multiplication does not matter, so you can simply collect the two terms. In matrix mechanics, the order of multiplication does matter, so we calculate the commutator. We can write down all the terms of the dot product and then use the fact that the commutator with momentum is a derivative with respect to position. We calculate the derivatives and collect terms to find the value of the commutator. The final result is given by the classical result plus an extra term due to the commutation relations of matrix mechanics. We now have obtained all the results that are required to relate the quantum Runge-Lenz vector to the energy. We previously took the dot product of the runge lenz vector with itself and found many terms. With the results we just found, we can greatly simplify this expression. We substitute in all the results to rewrite all the terms. Then we collect two terms and cancel out two other terms. We rearrange the terms such that we recognize the expression for the energy. This final result shows how the quantum runge lenz vector is related to the energy matrix. When we compare the classical formula to the quantum formula, we see that all our extensive calculations have led to a small but significant extra term of h bar squared. This is the result that Pauli used to demonstrate that matrix mechanics reproduces the well-known formula for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. He plugged in the solutions for the runge lenz vector and the angular momentum vector, which can be found using the methods that we used in our explanation of the Zeeman effect, and which had already been developed by Born, Heisenberg and Jordan. He then used this equation to find the energy matrix, and he verified that the energy values match with the well-known formula for the energy levels of hydrogen. So to summarize, we started with the quantum formula for dispersion which implied that the electron can be modeled as a collection of virtual oscillators, whose oscillation frequencies coincide with the frequency of the radiation that is emitted due to electron transitions. Using the fact that, in the limit of high quantum numbers, the amplitudes of such virtual oscillators should coincide with the Fourier coefficients of the classical electron orbit, it was found that one should calculate with these collections of virtual oscillators using the rules of matrix multiplication. To find the laws that govern the time evolution of quantum mechanical matrices, we use Sommerfeld's quantization rule from the old quantum theory and Hamilton's equations of motion from classical mechanics. This led to Heisenberg's equation of motion and the canonical commutation relation, which form the basis of matrix mechanics. To verify the validity of this new quantum mechanical formalism, matrix mechanics was used to reproduce well-known results of the hydrogen atom which were previously derived from ad hoc rules. So matrix mechanics successfully turned a collection of arbitrary quantum mechanical rules into a coherent theoretical framework. However, this theory was also very abstract, since it didn't allow for a clear visualization of an electron and its motion. It took the development of Schrodinger's wave equation to provide new insights into quantum mechanics.